Football claims to be the world's most popular sport, fiercely competitive yet defined by its rules. But what happens to its integrity if results are rigged, games are fixed and players and officials can be easily corrupted? That's what the king of match fixers said he did for years. So where stands football now? A small Hungarian courtroom might seem a long way from any of the world's major football arenas. But the fixture being played out here may be just as important to soccer's future as any international tournament. Football's governing bodies know that what's at stake is the integrity of their sport. Played by millions, watched by billions, the most beautiful game is under threat. Over the past few years, Global investigations have unveiled an intricate international criminal network run from Singapore. For well over a decade, it's claimed, it's manipulated football at all levels, from amateur matches to the FIFA World Cup. Members of that syndicate are now on trial here in Budapest for match fixing. One of the key prosecution witnesses is this man, Wilson Raj Peramal the world's most notorious match fixer. For months now, his account of how he and his associates corrupted global football has been sending shockwaves through the sport. My name is Wilson Raj, I'm from Singapore. I work with a friend of mine called Nancy I have a fixed football matches together with Nancy Tan Satang, also known as Dan Tan, is also on trial, albeit in absentia. According to Hungarian prosecutors, he was the financier and mastermind of the syndicate, whose members made tens of millions of dollars by gambling on the games they rigged. They came from Bulgaria, Hungary, Slovenia and Singapore. And Wilson Raj Peramal was their match fixer in chief. And then usually tells me that Arrested in Finland in 2011, Paramal was sentenced to two years in prison for match fixing. He was extradited to Hungary in late 2012 to serve as a prosecution witness in another trial. Paramal's main Singaporean associates, including Tan Satang, are now behind bars in the Lion City. Exactly in September in 2013, um, Dan Tan and 13 of his uh, alleged syndicate members were arrested by the Singapore authorities. And currently, as we speak, there are four of them still being held under Section 55, uh, basically held uh, without uh, trial for whenever. Zaihan Mohamed Youssef is an investigative journalist for Singapore's The New Paper. He's the author of more than a hundred articles and a recently published book about match fixing. Wilson Raj Perumal, in my opinion, is a Singapore match fixer who put the country on the world map. Uh, he, in, in, in telling the authorities in Europe what he used to do with the people that, uh, you know, that was around him, uh, that opened a big can of worms. Zaihan says that Paramal's involvement in match fixing began in the late 1980s. Enticed by the big money to be made, he started rigging amateur games in Singapore and made some important connections along the way. In the 1990s, he got to know the right people like Rajendran Pal Kurusami, who uh, was one through Buki, where who, who in court he made this uh, stunning admission that he made anywhere from one point something million to 11 million dollars in bets in six months. So you can imagine that everybody wanted to be someone like him. At the time, Rajendran Pal Kurasami 
was considered to be the kingpin of Southeast Asian match fixing. Wilson Raj Paramel was hired as one of his trusted runners. Pal's golden age ended in 1994 when Singaporean and Malaysian authorities decided to crack down on match fixers, corrupt officials, players, and referees. Among those arrested was Tiru Rajamanikan, the world's first FIFA accredited referee to be convicted for corruption. Rajamanikan was sentenced to nine months in prison in 1994 for receiving money from PAL. See, match fixing is a disease. Gambling is what? It's all with money, dollars and cents. You can't run away from the truth. If I give you a million, you will accept it. From jail, Rajamanikam watched as Paramal and others ventured abroad to find new, safer markets. Well, Singapore is a small place. Communication is easy. So after, after having all this, they exploit it overseas. So this is how it all started. Global. Asian match fixers exploited the global online gambling boom of the late 90s that allowed users to punt on football matches in the remotest corners of the game. Francesco Boranca is the general secretary of Fedebet, an association that monitors matches around the world and that has recently signed a memorandum of understanding with FIFA to fight match fixing. In the past, uh without technologies, it was not so easy to bet on a match of a second division in Czech Republic. And of course, the offer of the bookmaker was very reduced comparing to now. Online betting companies in Asia are often unregulated and offer huge betting volumes compared with the rest of the world. If someone wants to bet 500,000 euro on a match of Premier League, just has to put the money on the, this Asian bookmaker and he can make it very easily without any kind of check. But of course, placing that bet becomes more attractive if the outcome is already known. Peramal and other match fixers aim to turn a gamble into a near certainty, usually by bribing key players in a team to ensure a victory for their opponents. Not everybody can fix and not everybody is blessed with, um, or shall I say cursed with the ability to fix a football match. Fixing can provide you uh, instant profit of about a couple of millions within uh, a year or so. Paramal's first big venture beyond Singapore took him to the USA. There, he claims, the syndicate he worked for managed to manipulate some of the football games of the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Those days, you know, we were not so afraid of this law enforcement and so on. There was no heat on match fixing. So you just approach a person, hey, look, you know, you want to do it or you don't want to do it. But Paramal was becoming a marked man. After returning to Singapore from the Olympics, he was arrested repeatedly due to one scam or another and spent almost a decade in prison. By the time he was released in 2006, his boss, Pal Kurosami, had faded from the scene and Paramal began to sell his know-how to the highest bidder. It wasn't like an academy or somebody was teaching this person to do. So it is all your own initiative. You take your own initiative, you approach the team, you get the team. If you have the money, you do the business yourself. If you don't have the money, then of course there are other people who are prepared to invest. To evade the authorities, Paramal's initiatives now became more sophisticated. He came up with new schemes such as inviting FIFA-affiliated football associations to play friendly matches in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. This, he claims, made it easier to target players from poverty-stricken national teams. In 2007, he fixed his sights on Zimbabwe. Well, I put an offer on the table that uh, all paid expenses uh, for the entire team, food, accommodation, transport, everything taken care of and they will be receiving 50,000 US dollars per match if they are able to dance to my tune. Four years later, Paramal's relationship with Zimbabwe's national team would erupt into a scandal that the local media dubbed Asiagate. In 2012, 80 Zimbabwean officials and players were banned from the game by the National Football Association, ZIFA. But by then, Zimbabwe wasn't alone. 
Paramal says he was able to infiltrate other African national teams. Players and officials from Lesotho, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Mozambique, Togo and Kenya were all ready to fall under his spell, taking part in international friendlies he arranged for the benefit of his gambling syndicate. You go back home with a lot of money. After all, it's, it's, it's a friendly football match and, and nobody's going to talk about it the next day. Eventually, Paramal's exploits came to the attention of a powerful Singapore bookie called Tan Satang, also known as Dan Tan. The two decided to team up, coupling Paramal's experience on the ground with Dan Tan's gambling acumen and access to funds. Together, they would make millions of dollars from wagers on fixed games. In 2009, Paramal established a sports management company called Football for You International to interact plausibly with national football associations. The company was located at this address in Singapore's Little India, in the back of a photocopy shop. People like Wilson Raj has fine-tuned the art of match fixing by giving it an air of legitimacy uh, through setting up companies which are legit sounding. But uh, you know, it, it, it says a lot about football associations who, you know, they're supposed to do due diligence, but they didn't. The syndicate's reach, as revealed by Paramal's correspondence, was astonishing. To keep generating cash, more and more games were rigged to order. Soon, Paramal and Dan Tan were attempting to meddle in major competitions, like the Women's World Cup, the Olympics in Beijing, the Africa Cup of Nations, the AFC Cup in Asia, the Gold Cup in North America, and even the official qualification matches for the 2010 FIFA World Cup in South Africa. Not all their attempts were successful, but in dozens of games, the syndicate's corruption paid off, casting a dark shadow over the genuine achievements of many honest players who never suspected they might be playing in rigged games. Oberfemi Martins is one of those honest players. His skills have made him a feature in the Nigerian national side for most of the last decade, winning 39 caps and scoring 18 goals. Martins is now playing in America with the MLS side Seattle Sounders. But for Nigerian Super Eagles fans, among his greatest achievements are the goals he scored against Kenya on the 14th of November 2009 that took Nigeria to the 2010 FIFA World Cup. It's the final round of qualifiers in Group B. It's Kenya against Nigeria from the Kasarani Sports Complex in Nairobi. Nigeria, they're still hoping to qualify for South Africa 2010. To do that, they're reliant on Mozambique beating Tunisia, the group leaders. That game taking place in Maputo at the same time. I think I didn't get a chance to watch it like this, but, you know, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the fans in Nigeria because uh, they thought at the time they, they think we're not going to qualify to the, to the 2010 World Cup. After a tense first half sitting on the bench and watching Kenya take the lead, Martins came on as a substitute and turned the match around, first scoring an equaliser. Odom Wingy to Martins, surely 1-1. Oberfemi Martins. And then the all-important winning goal. Have men over at the back post. Yusuf Martins. The Oberfemi Martins scores again his second of the game. And surely this time that's Nigeria through to the World Cup. Oberfemi Martins off the bench. And he is the hero. It mattered because that same afternoon, against and all expectations, Tunisia had lost to Mozambique. Suddenly from nowhere and to the delight of their fans, Nigeria was going to the world's greatest football tournament. I couldn't believe it, but still, you know, so excited that I scored a winning goal. And um, we were so surprised, even the coach and everybody. But unbeknownst to Martins, Wilson Raj Paramal claims to have also had a hand in Nigeria's dramatic qualification. It all began, he says, with his relationship with a Nigerian football agent. 
I had a colleague there, a friend of mine called um, Prince Odira, who had links to uh, Nigeria Football Association. And uh, I had brought previously Nigeria to a tournament in Malaysia, the Intercontinental Cup. And uh, so that is how um, I planned with Odira to, to approach the Nigerian Football Association. Prince Odira, also known as Odira Eze, is a Nigerian national and football agent. As these documents in Al Jazeera's possession attest, he clearly also had close links to the Nigerian Football Federation. In September 2008, he was licensed by the Federation to organize international fixtures on its behalf and traveled with the national team on several occasions. That same year, he was photographed with Wilson Raj Paramal when Nigeria took part in the Intercontinental Cup in Malaysia. In late October 2009, just a couple of weeks before Nigeria's last World Cup qualifier against Kenya, Adira signed two letters to secure visas to Nigeria for Paramal and an associate, Manimaran Kalimutu. Kalimutu was one of the syndicate's most reliable runners who regularly carried money overseas for Paramal and passed it on to footballers in Kenya, Rwanda, Jordan and elsewhere. In early November 2009, he and Paramal flew to Nigeria and checked in to the Transcorp Hilton Hotel in Abuja. We reached uh, Abuja at 8 p.m. Nigeria time. We went and put our luggage in the room and Wilson told me to meet him downstairs at the lobby. There were people from the Federation and I didn't join them. I just went to the bar. I was having my chivas. During that meeting, Paramal claims to have offered members of the Nigeria Football Federation an extraordinary deal. I will make sure everything is done to help Nigeria qualify, which is I've got uh, two players or three players in the Kenyan team, and they will ensure Nigeria's uh, win on that day. And uh, on the other side is that um, um, I will probably, my company will uh, probably give a bonus to uh, Mozambique uh, of 100,000 US dollars to make sure they get a positive result with um, Tunisia. In exchange, Paramal says, he wanted his company, Football for You International, to be given an official mandate to organize pre-World Cup warm-up fixtures for the Nigerian national team. If a team makes it to the World Cup, there's uh, one point, between one to 1.5 million dollars for, uh, for their pre-camp before the World Cup, and they uh, get uh, an approximate sum of eight million dollars after the group stage is completed, and that's a lot of money for a football association. Three days before the Kenya versus Nigeria match, Paramal typed up this letter to the General Secretary of the Mozambique Football Association. Paramal promised the FA $100,000 if Mozambique won or drew their game against Tunisia. In the event, Paramal says, no money was ever sent to Mozambique, while that country's football association told us it has no recollection of ever receiving Paramal's offer. On November the 13th, the day before Nigeria's World Cup qualifier with Kenya, Paramal and three of his match-fixing team flew to Nairobi and checked into the Safari Park Hotel. This photograph shows Paramal and two associates, including Manimaram Kalimutu, in the hotel's lobby. Al Jazeera has obtained a number of emails between Paramal and these two Kenyan national squad players who'd be lining up against Nigeria in Nairobi. Some of the messages deal explicitly with fixing matches. In one email exchange about an earlier Kenyan World Cup qualifier against Tunisia, Paramel had asked, are you interested to do business against Tunisia? If yes, I understand we have four players. I will send my man with 75,000 US dollars for three of you and 15,000 US for the new player. The player responded, listen, my friend, we're serious and ready for the biz. 
We promise we won't let you down. I had got a relationship with uh, three players in the team and uh, two of them were starting the match and was on, one was on the bench. So I spoke to the players and they agreed to uh, help Nigeria win the match. On November the 14th, 2009, Kenya and Nigeria faced off in Nairobi, while Mozambique played Tunisia in Maputo. Eventually Mozambique beat Tunisia. I, I, I don't know how they did it and they managed to get uh, three points out of uh, Tunisia and Nigeria won and it was like uh, what I had planned. Nigeria qualified for the World Cup Finals. But not everything had gone to plan. Paramal and his associates had placed wages on Nigeria to win the match by two clear goals. And there's the final whistle. Nigeria have qualified for the World Cup in South Africa. Kenya 2, Nigeria 3. For once, Paramal had lost his bet. I only met three players after the match was finished. They came to the room and Wilson was telling them, I lost. They said, how could you lose? See, I told you, it must be a clear two goals. I didn't see them getting any money from Wilson. I don't think so, he would have paid. He was not in the mood to talk to anyone. When told that the Kenya-Nigeria match was fixed, Obafemi Martins could not bring himself to believe it. I remember the game so well that, uh, that I played against Kenya, that uh, it's not a fixed game. They, you know, they want to win. They want to win against Nigeria because they never win against Nigeria. So we want to win too because we want to go to the World Cup. So uh, it's not a fixed game for me. Paramal was unable to reap any immediate benefits from Nigeria's qualification for the World Cup. On his return to Singapore, he was arrested again, this time for an unrelated assault charge. By the time he was released a few weeks later, he says the deal he'd offered the Nigerian football authorities had gone cold. When I came out from the three weeks, I, I sent repeated emails to Odira asking him what is going on. Are you going to fulfill your promise or are you not going to feel full, fulfill your promise? Paramal wasn't given the access to Nigeria's World Cup warm-up matches and training camp that he'd sought. But in April 2010, the Nigerian Football Federation did grant his company, Football For You International, the right to organize other friendly games for the national team. The letter was forwarded to Paramal by his NFF contact, Adira Eze. We got in touch with Adira to ask about his relationship with the match fixer. Do you know Mr. Perumal, Wilson? Uh, it's not, uh, I don't know him so well, but I think uh, I remember sometime he came to Nigeria Football Federation office. I think that's where we met. Odira Eze denied that he ever knew Paramal was match fixing. He denied any knowledge of any offer or deal that Paramal made to him or to any NFF official before the Kenya qualifier. He did agree that he'd passed on the Nigerian Football Federation's letter of mandate to Paramal's company, Football For You International. He did not explain why. The letter of mandate bears the signature of one Mohamed Sanusi. At the time, he was the NFF's head of competitions. Now, he's its integrity officer. We asked him to explain the letter and the NFF's relationship with Paramal. Sanusi said that he does not remember signing the letter, that he knows who Paramal is, but has never met him in person. The Kenya-Nigeria game is only one of several World Cup qualification matches for the 2010 FIFA World Cup that Paramal claims to have influenced. In fact, he says he played a part in the qualification of five of the 32 teams that eventually took the field in South Africa. Surely then, these and his many other claims of corruption merit close examination by FIFA, the governing body of world football. We wrote to the FIFA media office and to their integrity office asking for an interview. FIFA refused to be interviewed and declined to comment on our findings. 
We also wrote letters to the Kenyan and Nigerian football federations, but received no reply. Back in Hungary, the case against Dan Tan and the other syndicate members is ongoing. In the meantime, Wilson Raj Paramal's account of how he and others managed so easily to corrupt the beautiful game is a shocking indictment of the sport that always professes to be the most popular in the world. But in the absence of any evidence that football's governing bodies are taking steps to make match fixing impossible, the sport could lose much of its appeal for players and spectators alike.